Thank you all for coming. Uh, I have to admit, I'm personally so excited because this is our first in-person artist talk since we had to close for COVID over a year ago. So uh, it's just a pleasure uh, to be able to, to uh, conduct it in this format. Uh, so uh, the exhibition, Not Afraid, uh, with Janice Elkins and Gina Lee Robbins have created a symphony of canvases, sculptures, and installations that render the human experience in abstracted yet vividly emotional ways using bold imagery, fractured form, and rich layers of texture, Elkins and Robbins have captured an uncensored psychological response to these restrictive and bewildering times. Both artists live and work in Oak Park, Illinois, and for the past decade have forged a friendship that has spilled over into an intergenerational dialogue through art. Organic forms in Robin's ceramic sculpture inspire the figures in Elkin's paintings and vice versa. With little formal training, both of these self-taught artists have found their voices through fearless experimentation and play. For the last 22 years, Elkins has owned and operated Gallery Pink, a mainstay in the Oak Park Arts District where she has featured many mid-career and emerging contemporary artists, as well as exhibiting her own work. Her expressionist use of color and distorted figures reveal the alienation of urban and domestic life. Her work has been exhibited in locales such as the University of Illinois at Chicago, Fort Wayne Art Museum, Coneline Museum of Art, University of Wisconsin, and Rockford Museum. Gina Lee Robbins is largely is a largely self-taught visual and teaching artist. She creates objects and installations by manipulating clay and found or repurposed materials. Gina began working with ceramics over 25 years ago when she picked up a job as a studio assistant in North Carolina ceramics studio. She currently works in a shared pottery studio and out of her home. She has exhibited or curated solo, invitational and juried group shows and competitions across the country and her sculptures are part of private and corporate collections worldwide. Gina is a teaching artist collaborating in K-8 through classrooms in both Oak Park and Chicago public schools and teaching at Wellness House, a cancer support center in the western suburbs. She's an active member of Chicago Sculpture International, the International Sculpture Center, and Woman Made Gallery. Our moderator for today's talk is Somia Natrabaile. Somia was born in Bangalore, India, and emigrated to the United States with her parents when she was seven years old. She first studied engineering at Rutgers University and then later went back to learn art at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. She currently lives and works near Chicago, splitting her time between painting and ceramics. Her work explores threads between the human body, terrain, and the natural world. She has exhibited at galleries both in and outside the United States. She most recently had her first solo exhibition at Part 2 Gallery in Oakland last month, and will be having another solo at Andrew Rafage Gallery this September. Her work is included in national and international collections. Welcome. Thank you. All right, should we start? All right, so um, this is, thank you all for coming. Uh, and I'm really bad at speaking loudly, so somebody just speak up if you can't hear me very well. Um, so 
So I've known both of these ladies for a long time, so it's really fun to be the moderator, or, you know, the person who's going to kind of lead them into these uh, into this discussion. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is, you know, your relationship to each other and and how you guys have grown as artists with each other. You've known each other for about a decade or so, right? And um, have shown together, and I know that um, you know you go to museums together and, and galleries together to, to look at art, so you have a rapport. Um, and so I was wondering, like, can you remember the first time that you saw each other's work, and and what was it about that work that you know sort of spoke? To you? So you want to start? Yeah. Um, yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mike, I had my gallery running oh, for about ten years before I saw Gina's work, and I happened to go to some venue in Oak Park where her work was on the wall, and immediately I loved it. I had a visceral reaction to it, and one of the reasons that it spoke to me is um, I like the fact that it wasn't real finished. Mm -hmm. There was a rough quality to it. And I asked her to bring her work into the gallery, and I had it in the gallery most of the time for about 10 years, am I right? Mm -hmm. uh, even if she just had a little area Mm -hmm. with work. Um, and I have a lot of her work. Uh, what was the other part of the question? Oh, and our relationship. Well, we didn't get close right away. I mean, it, the wonderful part of our relationship is that I feel it has grown in a very organic way over time. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just got closer and closer and um, I think maybe this would be a good time for me to to give uh, the backstory to the show. And the backstory is, I have had her work in the gallery. We've done group shows, but then I decided about two and a half, three years ago, that we should try to do a show together. And um, I said to Gina, "Why don't you bring in a bunch of your work?" And you can come in anytime. Of course. You remember. Of course. <laughs> um, and we'll pull out my canvases and see what we could do. So we put up a show, and I looked at Gina after it was up, and I said, Gina, this is a great show. I think you're going to have to promote it to different venues. Take it on the road. Take it and on the road. And that show was called Dark Matter. Was that, it, you know, I don't even remember what we called that. That show, that show I think, was called Residence. The one Residence, the two of us. Okay. Yeah. 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 Residence. Yeah. Well, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. But leading up to that, I mean, the first the first time I saw Janice's work was I had been away from making art, away from um, exhibiting uh, for, for probably 15 years or so, and was just getting back into it. and got involved with the Art League, the Oak Park Art League, right. and they invited me to participate in a group show at a satellite um, a satellite gallery that they have they, in the community, and Janice was in that group show. There was four, I don't even remember who the other artists were, but Janice was in that gallery, or in that show, and her work immediately spoke to me. The color, the crazy figures, the city scenes, like I just really responded to the work but I didn't meet her. And a few weeks after that closed, I got a call from the Art League and they said, Janet Elkins, who has a gallery and who's in this show, wants to get a hold of you because she wants you to participate in this winter show. And so that was the first start. And then I met her. And then over this period of 10, 11, 12 maybe years, um, every year we, she's put on some kind of group show. And, and I think the first, the early years was like, a group of six or eight artists, sure. and then it was a group of four artists, and then I think Dark Matter, there were three of us, right. and then ultimately, three years ago, it was just the two of us. Right. And I'm like, this is really fun. <laughs> you know? um, so that's that's how, how that developed. One of the things that's interesting is, you know, um, to me, that so your work is, is always got so much quality. 
and your work is much more muted. Mm -hmm. So I think it's interesting what you just said about, you know, what can we do to her work was that rough quality, but also I was just thinking, you know, that you come from a place of so much color all the time and, and you're very brave with your color and contrasts and and you know so that's interesting that you know you maybe the opposite appeal to you and the same with you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And actually my comments for this show will not include my black and whites because my black and whites are really uh, another newer area for, for me that I have not really investigated very much. These are really new and... and this one too? This one, this one too. Yes, this one too. And that one I suppose, the black, the all black one. Mm -hmm. Uh, but most of the time, I'm very committed to color. I mean, it just is so seductive for me. Right, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so the next thing I wanted to go towards is this, the title that you came up with, Not Afraid, and I, I'm, I walk with Gina, and I've kind of, you know, uh, been listening to her, have been listening to her like go through the iterations of what to call the show. So that was kind of fun for me to, you know, when she finally told me, it was just, it seemed like it fit so perfectly. Um, so this, the title, Not Afraid, you know, speaks to the a quality that's really important to all artists, and that is fearlessness. Um, because, you know, we, as, as artists, you just, you, it's something that's always sort of present in your practice, right? Um, combating it, right. right. So um, so I guess what I was wondering is if you could talk about whether this year of the pandemic brought to light anything, you know, any fears in particular, and if there's work here that speaks specifically about that. Tina, you go first, because I have less to say on that. Oh, okay. Um, so the theme, not afraid, we, we, uh, we did, we came up with this theme, we proposed the show three years ago, so it had nothing to do with the pandemic. It was more an expression of the way we work, um, sort of going against expectations, refusing to stick to a consistent body of work, be very experimental and exploratory. So that was really what we were thinking when we came up with the theme. Um, and then the show got postponed and, um, a couple times and um, ultimately we were still putting things together during the pandemic. So I think that um, there's definitely a, a lot of responding to the fear and paralysis that happened during the pandemic is evident here. Um, personally, a, a, you know, a little over a year ago when the pandemic first hit, I was paralyzed as an artist. I was not able to make work. I wasn't able to find a way to go the, to the shared ceramic space because of fears of infection. I wasn't able to work at home because there's all these additional people working and studying at home. Um, so I just was making masks for healthcare workers and incarcerated people for two or three months. Um, ultimately, the, you know, when I got to a place when I exhausted my energy making 1,200 masks, um, and I got to a place where I was able to find a way to get to the ceramic studio and um, carve out that time, I, I, I would go really, really early in the morning on the weekends, and then I had a, had a very open period of time where I could get my head back into that space of inspiration, which was really wonderful. And then working um, last summer, I did a lot of things outside. So the piece that is over there in the corner, the tall piece, um, is a piece that I worked on in my driveway, essentially, and on my porch. The, um, it, the, the bouffant nest thing on top um, was originally loose tubes that were going to be installed in, a, in an exhibition last summer. And that got postponed 
So I had this mass of these tubes and I and kind of responded to the, um, the form and, and wanted to present it as this and it kind of um, going along with this theme, not, not afraid. I wanted it to be something, a, a, an emblem of strength and bravery. Um, and so that's where that. So do you, um, so that's maybe the largest thing that you've made. Yeah, for was sure. that Was that a fear that you had to overcome? Like you'd never made anything that, quite that large scale. For sure, it was yeah. very, it was very scary for me to think, because I had this, this mound of this blue font and I was like, she needs to be really, really tall. And how do I do that? So, um, so that that got me through some of the, the fear and, and navigating that through the pandemic. And I um, I think I would be remiss not to mention a couple works that um, I did, you know, in the weeks before we installed here. Um, my father died from COVID in early February this year. And um, we installed on February, we opened on February 20th. So two of these works, both this um, installation on the floor still here, and Tarantella, the woven piece that's behind you on the wall, um, both of those pieces were, um, were me working through that period of mourning and grief immediately following his death. So, um, so I think that I should be bringing that up because if that's um, a fear that many of us have had to deal with through this pandemic, right. um, and it was just a way for me to deal with that. Yeah. yeah. The kind of person I am is if something bad happens in my life, I kind of go into denial. And I thought, oh, this isn't so bad. I'm still going to the studio. I'm still painting. But I think on some level, and the way I paint is, I just put work on the canvas, paint on the canvas, and then let it evolve. So whatever fears I did have, and I'm sure I had fears, because the whole idea of getting it or having family or friends get it is very scary. But to point to anything, maybe the one, the face, might be a part of it. And I think that's called eight misbehaving. Right. That might have been done during the COVID. Yeah, yeah. And it's, and you know, it's interesting is um, that piece, it's, it feels more like, you know, take this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, rather than you know, I'm, rather than being meek, right? Yeah, and, and dealing with that here, you're it, it's so in, in your face. face. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's uh, my feeling of the COVID, but nothing else that I could point to. Okay. Um, so this actually leads to because you you brought up this um, how things are you know inside of you and you just work through them. So the subconscious is really important in both of your both of your works. Um, you also seem to be drawn to making work that shakes up the viewer and uh, but your approaches are different, right? Um, so Janice, your work is more, I, I feel like it's more ambivalent, um, mixing contrasting emotions together often and you blend the shrill and the humorous together with sort of an aggressive agency, almost frenzied application of paint and color. Can you talk about Sure. Talk about that? And then <clears throat> I just remembered while I was sitting here, uh, a friend of mine who teaches process, <coughs> excuse me, process painting, which is pretty much the way I paint, just, you know, throwing stuff on the canvas, said, just think about doing the ugliest painting that you can think of. And that's that one back there with the three figures. And that seemed to really free me up. What Not that it, what, it, it was a while, maybe uh, four years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also do feel that in all due modesty, 
I have a very good sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> and the one next to it, I think, incorporates both the dark and the humorous. The name of that painting, and it's probably my favorite in terms of how the name works with the painting, is, and I don't know how many of you would remember this, because I've used old song titles, Is You Is or Is You Ain't My Baby. And while it is somewhat scary, if you look at the teeth, they're not sharp. <laughs> and actually my friend said to me, it actually looks like the monster is kind of laughing. Yeah, like they're sharing a joke. Yeah, yeah. right. So, do you, um, do you, do you, when while you're painting, um, do you, you know, kind of go through any psychological narratives, you know, while the work is developing, or you just let, you just paint, and then you, you think about it later? Oh, absolutely, the second. Okay. And I have an interesting one, and I talked to Gina about it after I made my discovery. I did a painting, my daughter used to, Take care, that's my daughter sitting right there. <laughs> uh, used to take care of Alzheimer people. And she brought one woman into the gallery who was probably fairly gaunt. And um, this woman had, had her doctorate, I don't remember what, but she was very brilliant. And it just, there was so much pathos that I felt about her that I did a painting, it's not hanging here, but it's in the catalog. I did a painting based on my um, reaction to her. And so I, this was maybe four or five years ago. And I'm looking at the painting, this was uh, maybe three years ago. I'm looking at the painting and I'm thinking, why did I put a head on her? And then I realized her head was gone. Mm -hmm. And that's really how I work. Mm -hmm. um, so, James, do you have any favorite artists that, that oh, you so think many. about, you know, or that, that have like influenced you more than others? I don't know. I mean, I've incorporated so many of them. Mm -hmm. uh, but, Gina, who. Who do people say paintings, even here, remind them of? Male. Male. New York. New York. New York. What's a male? I don't like my, my mind is gone. <laughs> Anyone. <laughs> Extra An abstract expressionist? He, he, did, he did the uh, clam. The clam guys. Gustin. Gustin, yeah. yeah. And people have <laughs> said to me. <laughs> you said that you yeah. have said that the curator said that. Oh, okay. I asked. <laughs> mm -hmm. Did you see it? When no. we were, oh, you saw it in my work. Yeah, when, yeah. We, were asking, when we were installing the show. Oh, okay. Ad Adrian, direct the director, um, yeah. asked me if you liked his work. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. And you know, there are so many other artists that I love. But I also have an interesting story to tell. Uh, I'm reading an article this morning in the latest New Yorker of uh, Helen Frankenthaler. And did you read it? No, not yet. I have a bookmark. Uh, and uh, her state paintings. Okay, so they're talking about that. But they mentioned when she was very young, I would say seven, eight years old, she used to take her mother's nail polish and put it in the sink in the kitchen and watch it spread out. And it just struck me how our early experiences mm -hmm. so dramatically influence what we do. It's the other. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so with your work, you know, all your pieces seem to have so much personality. They, you know, somebody here pointed out that, that the piece over here, it could be alive. I mean, it looks like an animal, and that one also looks like it could be moving. Um, and 
you know, you often title them humorously, but when you stand in front of them, they're actually kind of off-putting and disconcerting for the viewer. So um, I'm just wondering, like, is this something that you know you're thinking about while you're working? That thinking about the, the psychological effects of what you're making, you know, might have on on the person who's going to be experiencing it. I'm not trying to affect anyone, <laughs> um, but I. Um, but it's a, so, is it a topic that's fascinating for you? It's probably. It, I mean, certainly the more more provocative, um, the more things that are things that are visually provocative are more interesting to me. Um, you know, I'm a fan of horror films. You know that. Like the the um, so. I like to go there mm -hmm. because it's because I'm responding to it. Mm -hmm. So if there's something that is um, curious or a little ugly or dark yeah. in the work, it's and there's also like this, this you know you also you also touch upon a little bit of taboo, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, especially when you're like pulling parts of the body into your your pieces. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think I mean you know that's that's it, that's fun for me. It's it's a it's a way of being playful. I think um, because it's a part of our experience. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't I don't know that that really speaks to it, but um, I definitely I'm, I'm working very intuitively. So I mean it's not there's very few pieces. Um, Probably just two or three pieces in this show where I had an idea of what I was working towards when I sat down to begin work. Um, so a lot of it is playing with materials and playing with forms mm -hmm. and how I respond to it. Is it? Can you can you um, point to any real experiences for any of these pieces? You know that might have influenced the power that they have. Um, Real experiences. So, I, I kind and you of, talked about your father's death. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. um, but like, so I'm thinking about like that one right there. That piece. Yeah. Um, that that piece is not really doesn't really um, respond to a particular experience. Um, I think it is it's definitely an exploration of the organic and the body, and um, to some extent. The feminine, it's got my hair on there. Um, I think that the piece in the corner, which is called figure, um, may have more. There, you know, there's a lot going on with that piece. The piece originally, um, I had an idea of the form before I started, and this is something that I do often with the ceramic forms. Is I will base it on. A sketch of my misperception. So if I'm driving down the road or watching a movie and there's something in the background or something in my periphery that catches my eye that is a shape that is not what I'm seeing. You know, if I turn and look, I see, oh no, that is a parking meter. But there's something in the way I've misperceived it that's interesting to me. And so that, that's where that originally came from. This it was this. And then I'll sketch it. So I sketch, and I don't even remember what the original, what I was perceiving, but um, that's what the form came from. But then as I was making it, um, I started to think about my experience as a mother. Mm -hmm. And so that's what's going on, in fact, with right. that. Um, so it's really a self portrait of my self as a mother. Mm -hmm. And these are, these, these holes are. Um, an indication of my two children that I birthed and that are at the brink of leaving the nest. Um, for those of you who know me, know that I'm there in, in my life. But um, so, so sometimes those kinds of you know these experiences do work for themselves. Yeah. Right. Um, so with with that piece and Praise B and um, what's the other one? and. Uh, you know these voluminous forms that are filled with you know they look like they're pregnant or they're filled with something 
there's this connection I see to voodoo sculpture, the, the empowered, you know, the empowered, um, like the bully, and uh -huh. um, these like these magic objects. Uh -huh. um, so I was, you know, I was wondering if if that's something that you're, you know, you're investigating at all. This this idea of the empowered object, and you know, with those voodoo bullies, they were placed in front of either you know a person's house to ward off evil spirits and sometimes they were placed in front of their enemy's house mm -hmm. um, so you know they're they're extremely full of magic and power mm -hmm. for that culture mm -hmm. and there is that sense that you know that the viewer gets when you stand in front of some of these these pieces of yours that there is like you don't want to get too close. Uh -huh. That's it. It's interesting that you say that because I think you know that I'm, I, I'm, I adore um, the Boli sculptures um, from West Africa and the Voodoo sculptures and and these ritual objects that um, are somehow empowered. Um, I'm not. I don't think that I'm. You know, this isn't an aesthetic that I respond to, but I don't. I, when I'm making these objects, I'm not thinking that. Um, I'm completely honored that you're seeing that kind of power, that you're experiencing that kind of power in them. Um, but I do, but particularly with these three, these three ceramic pieces, Praise Be, Purge, and Herself. These are, they're, they're definitely forms that are, have come to life for me. Right. Um, and in a lot of cases, when I'm Sculpting with ceramic, I'm, I'm not, as I said, I'm not starting um, with an idea that the, the figure in the corner is different because I've started with a form in mind. Um, but like most of the, the ones I'm making, I'm just putting together um, slabs to make a hollow form and just using chance and um, intuition until I have somehow manipulated the form something that I'm responding to. Um, so that's what's, what's happened with all of these three. That kind of leads me to the next question, which is, you know, if you, both of you could kind of speak about your processes. Um, do, you, do you consider the choices that you make while you're, you're making your objects as arbitrary or, or random? And is this like an important tool in, in your process? Um, in your practice, and you know, and just just to be uh, so with arbitrariness, ar arbitrary is sort of a choice or decision that's based on individual um, discretion or judgment. Uh, the decision actually doesn't matter that much. It's it's more intuitive. It's responsive. With randomness, it's that it's that the choice is not at play. Random means having unpredictable outcomes, but all outcomes are weighted at the same level. So Janice, do you want to go first? Well, I think, I think it's hard for me to answer that, but this is what I will say. When I go to paint, I just throw color on and make marks. And after about 10 or 15 minutes, I'll go and sit back. I would say, <clears throat> I'll look at the canvas uh, at maybe 60% of the time and 40% of the time I'm painting. And eventually, something starts to speak to me, and then I'm just trying to see what, what would, I mean, I don't know where this came from. This is very unusual for me. Although, in the scheme of all my work, it doesn't look that unusual. But it just happened. And I keep looking at it and keep looking at it. And it takes me weeks, if not months, to really make sure it's finished. Okay. Do you rework it? Oh yeah. Oh, oh yeah. I'll put on 
a, a, a green in, then I don't think it works so well, and then I'll put on another color, and I keep changing. Some happen, that one, wait, that one in the back there. Is that jive? I think it's jive. It happened, I think, pretty fast. But for the most part, most of my work takes a very long time. <clears throat> that is interesting because, like, your mark making is so rapid and yes. free. Yeah. Um, and immediate. Yes. Right? Yes. So that's, that's interesting you say that, you know, it, it takes that long. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It looks like it's been made in one setting. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. No. no it never happens, really. And I'd like to make another connection with Gina and I. Um, I think both of us have been able to get into the dark side of life and absorb it and live there for a while. Because I think a lot of our work reflects the dark side. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I love that whole idea. Dark side. I have always. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so could you talk about your process and how how a piece sort of comes together for you? Well, I'm mean, just speaking to the, the whole randomness thing. I think I gosh, I would love I would love to make work that was completely random. Um and um but, and I think that um, some of my process involves randomness. So like the collecting of these misperceived forms that I'm seeing out of the corner of my eyes and, and the desire to, to start there feels a little bit random. Um, the way I collect materials, I mean, you know, there's very few people who will walk with me any, anymore because I stop and pick things up and Sonia continues to walk with me. Um, but, uh, I pick things up in the woods, I pick things up, I pull over on the road and pick up, you know, somebody's weed that's fallen you out. Bite, I, you bite and see something and then you go back, I go back, I go back with a backpack so I can pick up the mattress springs that I saw on a bike ride. You know, I'm, I'm picking stuff up all the time. People bring me things without me asking for them. People, people give me you know, somebody brought me something on Friday night to a to an event I was at that they had been holding on to for four years that they found on the beach in North Carolina. I thought of you, this is creepy, you know, so, so, and some people have brought you their baby teeth, like baby's teeth or something like so that. Yeah, somebody, somebody, uh, somebody gave me x-rays from their mother's brain surgery, I've gotten teeth, you know, everything. So, I, the, so this collection of materials is very random, but I... I'm very purposeful in how I put them yes. together. Um, so, for instance, I, I collect a lot of plastic because it looks somewhat beautiful or interesting in the environment, but I don't often use plastic in my work. Um, I will give that to my friends who work with plastic. But, um, but so, so the ultimate creation of the work, and I, and I think this is similar to what Janice, she may be making marks in a very random way, but how she finishes and the time she takes, that feels more arbitrary. So you know, more, there's more choice um, involved there. But I would love to not have that value and just make work that was completely random. It feels very nihilistic, and I, I would love to go there. And maybe I will someday if yeah. I'm able to. But it's really hard to, uh, to, to have that release. So um, the next thing that um, I want to talk about is this orifice, because there are a lot of holes in, in Gina's work, especially, but also, you know, in Janice's, it's not, you know, the same kind of hole, but, you know, so for Janice, your, your paintings are often, and I've noticed this for years, the figures have open mouths. And I think that's really, it's always intrigued me, like the mouth are open and I've seen paintings where I'm not sure if somebody's screaming or crying or shouting or yelling or what, you know, or just talking. Um, so, you know, I think that's, it's kind of interesting 
dynamic that you put in there. Um, and definitely it makes, I was, I was pointing this out to you before, as you know, with Pat, putting figures in that, that have open mouths immediately <laughs> sort of infuses a narrative because something's going on. Whereas the figure was just, with, you know, a face without, with just a closed mouth, it could be a portrait, it just, it's more still, right? So um, I'm just wondering, what is, what is it about, about that that intrigues you? That, you know, I, I never think about that, which is interesting, but now I'm looking at the face I did there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and what I often do, and I've done other faces, um, I do the red lips. Uh, now that one has an open, uh, definitely has an open mouth, and it probably, I, I have no idea, I have no idea, the monster has an open mouth, yeah. and the other painting there is an open mouth, and painting too, you have open mouth, um, this one too, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I have no idea what the open mouth means to me, it just happens, that's something that really, is buried in my psyche because I, I I can't even imagine what it means. Except except maybe uh, the desire to be heard. Yeah. I, I feel also like that open mouth, you know, makes your paintings breathe a little bit. Mm. And it's almost like a you know literal meta literal uh, symbol of that. You know, that you taking a breath or you emitting a breath. Yeah. It definitely makes it, it, it creates a, a very live moment that's yeah. captured yeah. rather yeah. than um, a static portrait. I mean, every, it's in process, it's a moment in life. It's right. just captured. Right, right, right. Because the, the monster would look much different with a closed mouth. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, with you, you have holes all over the place. Holes, holes. Yeah, sometimes it's only one hole, but a lot of times there's many of them. And so, you know, so what is what is the fascination with openings? And, um, you know, how do you see them function in terms of the whole piece? Um, so this has become kind of a bad joke, and it, it um, it's also not, it's, it's really not something that I'm, okay, how can I work holes into this piece? This is not what I'm consciously thinking or doing, um, but people people, res people respond that way. They're like, I, I, I installed in a coffee shop and I didn't install all the work and one of the employees was like, I don't think I can really be around the work because I have that trypophobia or whatever, like, which is a fear of holes. And <laughs> I didn't understand what, that had to do with my work until I started to look around and I was like, oh no. Um, but, and somebody who came to this show said the same thing, there's a lot of holes going on, what's going on? And I don't, I don't consciously work that in. I think that, um, I think in, in a similar way to what I expressed with Janice's work, it, it definitely infuses some life, mm -hmm. um, especially to these abstract forms. It, it anthropomorphizes them. Um, do you like, intend the do you intend the viewer to or do you would you like the viewer to see them as mouths or other um, parts of the body? Not necessarily. Sometimes there's a, there's a hole and it just it just um, it's just some some way of communicating. I think that um, really we are the way we communicate with each other, the way we relate to each other is through our orifices. We're speaking. We're hearing. You know. We're our, our sexual relations are through orifices. We're, this is how we interact with each other. Um, so I think just by even just a single one, it becomes sort of alive to me. Mm -hmm. um, by, by taking an abstract form and putting one opening, all of a sudden it's a head. Or, yeah. um, and you have pieces that you've made where there's groupings. They're, they're not individual. And oftentimes, Within the groupings, every piece in the group has an open hole. Mm -hmm. And so, what happens is that you get the sense that 
they are communicating with each other in some mm -hmm. weird way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that, commu that, that level of communication, I think too, I'm just really interested and curious about what is on the inside and versus what is on the outside um, of things that I encounter and, and, and people that I encounter, just like physically and metaphysically, what's mm -hmm. going on underneath the surface. Um, and so by, with these entries into my sculpture, kind of have that view. Mm -hmm. I mean, in some pieces, like not this wall piece that is ceramic with coarse hair on the top that's on the wall here, this little piece. I mean, that has holes in the bottom that you don't even know are there. Um, so, so I just, um, yeah. Um, so could you both speak a little bit about your mediums? Um, Janice, I know you also do drawings, and I, you, you've done prints too, haven't you? Yeah. yeah. Um, so <coughs> can you talk about your experience with the different mediums and what you prefer? I love printmaking, and I studied it, and I didn't paint during this time. I studied it for about two or three years. And what I loved about printmaking is the magic that happens when you make a print. You're not sure how it's going to turn out. Um, I also have done photography, and I love photography. I also have done encaustic, which I also like a lot. But you know, at this point, I'm going to be 83 next month. And um, one of the problems I have of aging is that I, I have a loss of energy. So that I don't have a lot of energy. So I feel I have to really be focused. And I prefer to focus on the painting. As, oh, what I do do, by the way, is, did I say this? I think I said it to you for 40 years, on and off and mostly on. I have taken clay classes, mm -hmm. but not the wheel, just hand building. Mm -hmm. And my clay classes are just fun. I, I think have, that that informs your paintings. Oh yeah, I think everything informs the paintings. Yeah. But certainly the clay, because right now I'm, there's a, partner in my clay class sitting there. I go once a week and it's my happiest time. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not, there is no critical part of me. I can make something so funky and silly. Right now, actually, I'm making salt solvers. Um, oh, I made these earrings. I made up a whole bunch of earrings. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's my play time. And yeah, it informs, but I can't tell you how it informs. It's mm -hmm. just that, that with everything else informs. Because you have such a variety of materials that you work mm -hmm. with. Mm -hmm. You have a stash. I have, <laughs> I have a stash. I have a bit of a stash. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, it, it, the, the two very different things, like the working with the clay, mm -hmm. um, and that is, I, I think of it as my primary medium, but I was working, I was making things out of found materials when I was really small. So that's always been there. Um, but, the, you know, working with clay, I just love the malleability. I love the unpredictability and the magic that happens with clay when you, you know, get it out of the kiln and um, you don't know how it's going to survive and if it's going to survive. Um, so that that is very interesting to me. Um, and then the other materials, I think that, like I said, I, I will collect plastic and then ultimately not use it. I, I, most of the materials that I'm um, drawn to are tend to be more natural. Mm -hmm. So you know, rubber and hair and textiles are softer, um, but I, you know the metal too. I like so. I don't, I don't know, it just, um, I like that they sort of represent, they give this indication of time mm -hmm. and um, experience and, you know, because we interact, I mean, everybody's interacted probably with most of the materials that I have here at some um, 
some level, um, so you can relate to that, mm -hmm. but also using that to make something that's completely brand new. Um, and to that point, some of, some of these materials are very meaningful, like the, the, the material that is in the sort of locus area of that piece charmed that goes up the wall, the off-white air piece material that's the inside of my grandmother's couch, mm -hmm. you know, her sofa from the 50s. So, so these things have some kind of, and, and that goes back to these power, exactly. um, these power objects that it, it becomes powerful because of the material. Right. Because oftentimes you, you're using things that are, you know, organic, mm -hmm. or when you're using inorganic materials, you end up creating something that looks organic. Mm -hmm. Um, that's what I had, but should we open it up for questions then? Yes, yeah. definitely. Anyone? I have a question to ask. <clears throat> when I scan and look at these paintings, especially the ones that are very um, abstract, oftentimes I see things in the background, and I wonder if that's purposeful, or if it's just that you keep painting things over, and, and they're showing through. Oh, can you give me an example? Can you walk up and give me an example? Yeah, the, the new one that I have never seen before. It's been there for a while. There's, if you get fairly close to it, there's blue. Mm -hmm. Oh, the black one. Yeah, yeah and, and it has a face in it. Yes. And there's there's a, there's the more you look at it, the more you see in there. Right. Is that purposeful or is that just painting over things? Painting over. <laughs> but you know, <laughs> Oh, Actually, okay. this was hanging That's in my nice. studio. A lot of times this happens. You know, this was hanging in my studio <laughs> for a long time. And I thought, mm, I, I don't even know if it's good. You know, it just... And mm -hmm. um, once it was up, once we made the decision of how, how to put things up and it's under a bright light, then you begin to see what happened. All the layers. Yeah, so that, that yeah. was... A lot of times when they're just black, when there's a lot of black, like in that one, the yeah. one down there, there's a ton of stuff underneath. underneath. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can, I do allow it to come through a lot of times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this one, I don't even thought. I don't, I don't the black one. I don't even think I thought about it because it wasn't so bright when I was painting it. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of texture in some of your pieces. Yeah, is that? From just rework, or is that something that you're? No, it's rework. Okay. It's rework. I, I can't think of anything else. Maybe Heavy Metness Jones has a lot of texture, and that was reworked a lot. There's a lot of stuff by Heavy Metness Jones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. there's, so they're like fossils of your Yeah, right. Of right. The work, right? Right. Yeah. Anybody else have any questions? I'm one of my fond moments on a great show. I'm Nancy's sister, sorry, I am. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great show for both of you. And um, the complimentary aspect of it is really great. And it's, it's um, obvious that you both work in the same kind of process. And it's, it's really terrific. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question. Um, do you ever throw anything out? In other words, you've made something, but somehow it doesn't feel right at that time. Do you just maybe put it in a corner or shelve it, or do you? What do you do with it? Do you, you mentioned you rework? I rework, but sometimes I, I do get annoyed. And usually, when I'm painting, it's joy, pure joy. Even if something isn't working, I know eventually it will work. But sometimes I get annoyed and just put it aside and may not go back to it for a long time. And sometimes I think something is done, because I constantly look through my work, and I think, hmm, I think I'm gonna rework this. Do you doubt yourself at all, or do you just know that it will eventually just happen? Do I doubt myself? Yeah. No. <laughs> no. I don't doubt myself because um, I'm not aiming for anything in particular. You know, I don't do my work to sell because uh, 
most of my work, some of my work sells, of course, but I mean, I don't know too many people that would buy those two. Oh, no, no, the <laughs> second one. <laughs> Do I have an offer? <laughs> <laughs> but okay, but generally, or the pink girl there, um, you know, I do it because I love doing it. Mm -hmm. So there's no reason for me to doubt because I don't care. Yeah. So what's the story with that pink girl? Is that the uh, mask flying, right? It looks like the mask. This was done way before COVID. I thought it was a COVID painting. I no. No, it's so funny. I thought you took the painting and added it. No, no, no. It was uh, and is, she, is she scared? Is she upset? She well, looks upset. You know, uh, someone in the painting world once said to me, as an abstract painter, you should never tell people what it is because then you rob the viewer of being able to give them their own interpretation. Mm -hmm. So it is whatever you think it is. Now I actually think the show would have been called Be Afraid. <laughs> <laughs> is there anything that either of you want to add? Like, want to talk about a specific piece at all? So, what do you, Gina, what do you do with the stuff that you don't use? I'm curious about the question. Oh, yeah, you do. Oh, say. about the yeah. app. Well, um, <laughs> besides that, <laughs> well, but sometimes I give them to friends. Um, I'm also laughing because people are drawing things out and giving them to you. You're taking all their stuff. So I'm in a period of downsizing right now, personally. So this this issue of what to do with the things I'm no longer in love with anymore um, is. Is a, is a thing. I do have a graveyard in my backyard with broken and unloved ceramic pieces, so my, they're all in the garden, um, and those will have to, to go someplace. Um, sometimes I rework things, too. So, for instance, this piece Lush that's suspended in the middle of the room um, was installed a year and a half ago um, standing upright on a, on a stake. Um, so I will re, rework them. This piece that is on the ground, um, still here, is the first time it's been installed like this, but it is made up of four different sculptures that are in there. So um, so I will rework work, um, and I will also destroy work. <laughs> so I recently chopped up this paper mache thing, and I made repurpose them, I may set the whole thing on fire. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I'll... I'll, I'll oh, the paper mache? Mm -hmm. Show them. It's not in here. Oh, so... so the, the red one? The piece that I destroyed? Yeah, this piece. This piece is really, I chopped it up. So. <laughs> oh, it's already destroyed. Kind of, but it may come... It may be... Reincarnated. <laughs> what motivated you to destroy it? Well, it had been outside, so it was like it was it was um, worse for the wear. Right. Just having that because it was it, it exhibited. The photo is from it being exhibited in my yard for Art in Place, um, where artists put you know, put art sort of in front of their homes. Anyone else have a question? No? Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.